Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, we pray that the living power of Christ would come, fill our hearts, lead us from the doldrums of earth to the glorious heights of heaven. Help us walk through the valleys onto the mountain top, knowing that you're there by our side, taking us through every valley, leading up us up the rough places to the mountain of glory where we can see your face. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the 15th century, the Spanish Empire developed a motto, and the motto was Ne Plus Ultra, means simply no more beyond. The kings and queens of Spain believed that their empire had spread over the world and there, was no more, there were no more worlds to conquer. They believed that their empire was so large that there was no more beyond. It was in 1492 that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella helped to finance the voyages of an explorer by the name of Christopher Columbus. Have you ever heard of that name? And Columbus dispelled that myth as he traveled around the world and he discovered the new world. He showed that that motto, ne plus ultra, that there was no more beyond was totally false and simply a myth. You know, as I thought of that motto that the Spanish Empire had, no more beyond, I thought how that applies to many people's Christian lives. They have the idea that there is no more beyond. They've stuck in a rut. Their spiritual lives stagnate. They have stopped growing. They live within the circle of their own narrow thoughts. They are locked in a no-growth pattern. And if you ask them what their motto is, their motto is, well, there's no more beyond. I mean, I've studied everything there is to study. I know everything there is to know. They're kind of at this plateau of their Christian experience. They live as if there is nothing more beyond, that they're content with what they've experienced. Jacques Miller wrote an amazing poem about Christopher Columbus. And if you have any knowledge of history at all and geography, you'll be impressed with this poem. It goes something like this. And he's talking about Columbus. Beyond him lay the gray Azores, beyond the gates of Hercules, before him not the ghost of shores, before him, and you can almost imagine Columbus sailing the oceans, before him only shoreless seas. The good mate said, now we must pray, for lo, the stars are gone. Brave Admiral, what shall I say? Why, sail on, sail on, sail on. In other words, beyond the horizon, there's something more. You may just see these shoreless seas, but beyond the horizon, there's something more. If I were applying that to the Christian faith, I'd put it this way. Let your faith be stretched. Believe that God has something more for you. Trust that there is a deeper, richer experience than you currently have. Believe that God is going to lead you into the heights of glory, that He's going to lead you beyond the fog of spirituality where you are into something deeper, broader, and greater. Believe that in the face of obstacles, there's something more. Believe in the face of difficulties, there's something more. Believe in the face of overwhelming problems that there's something more. Believe in the face of opposition, there's something more. Believe in the face of criticism, there's something more. Believe in the face of doubt, there's something more. Believe in the face of fear, there's something more. Believe in the face of defeat, there's something more. Believe in the face of failures, there's something more. Now the Bible shares the lives of two characters that exemplify this spirit of belief and trust in God and this willingness to move forward in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming obstacles. Their names, Caleb and Joshua. Here's the setting. Israel is on the borders of the promised land. 
And as they are on those borders, there are obstacles that, fate, that lie between them and the promised land. Moses chooses 12 men, all leaders, to go out and spy out the land for 40 days. They quietly slip into Canaan. And as they quietly slip into Canaan under the cloak of darkness to spy out the land, Numbers 13 describes the story. So if you have your Bible, take it and turn to Numbers, the 13th chapter. We're looking at Numbers, the 13th chapter, and we're looking there at verses 17 to 20. Numbers 13, verses 17 to 20. Moses sends out the spies to spy out the land of Israel. Numbers 13, 17 to 20. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and, send, and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. Now that's pretty good espionage, isn't it? If you happen to work for the State Department, you work for the espionage agency, you are maybe posted in another country, and you're checking out the situation there. So here is Moses sending out a contingent for an espionage, and he says, go up. Uh, don't make yourself known. See whether they're strong or weak. See whether they're few or many. Verse 19, look at the geography of the land. See whether the land they dwell in is a good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests and there are not. Be of good courage. Bring some of the fruit of the land back. Now the time was for the season of the ripe grapes. So the spies went into the land, and their investigative analysis was thorough. The espionage report that they went brought back was complete. A positive report would spur Israel on to conquest. And so the spies followed Moses' instructions carefully. They were faithful to their assignment. They came back after 40 days and they gave a glowing report. And as they began their report, all Israel was excited. They were thrilled with this report. They thought, this is indeed the land that God has promised. We're going to move into this land rapidly. The spies even showed forth a cluster of grapes that was so heavy that it took two men to carry it as it hung on a pole between them. They also displayed baskets of figs and pomegranates, and you can just imagine the euphoria in Israel. You can just imagine the excitement in Israel. This is the land that the Lord God has given to us. But then, after being so ecstatic, after sensing that Canaan was more fantastic than they could ever imagine, after they sensed that it was beyond their wildest dreams, the spies went on. Numbers 13, verse 28 to 33. The scene changes rapidly. Israel goes from euphoria immediately to doubt. You're looking at the book of Numbers, the 13th chapter, the 28th verses and onward. And we see there that the scene changes very, very quickly. And uh, Israel, that had been so excited, now senses that there's a great problem. We're starting with the 28th verse. Nevertheless, the spies are speaking now. They said, we told you about this land, verse 27, that flows with milk and honey. Nevertheless. So they tell you all the positive things. They say, nevertheless. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The, the Amalekites dwell in the land to the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of Jordan. Let your eyes drop down to verse 32. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through, that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. In other words, this land, you go into it, it's going to swallow you up. 
Then it says in verse 33, there we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the uh, land, and they were like giants, and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And so we are in their sight. Now, did the land swallow people up? If the land swallowed people up, how did they ever get back? Were those people actually like, like giants? Certainly not. You see, the more you doubt God, the more you exaggerate your problems. Amen. See, the more doubt you have in your life, the problems are going to be bigger than you possibly can imagine. See, now there is the difference in the spies' reports. Caleb and Joshua come back, and they do not have their proverbial head in the sand. Caleb and Joshua see the same thing that the ten spies saw. But there's one more difference. Their God was bigger than the problem. Caleb and Joshua had a different focus. The focus of the spies was on the problem. The focus of Caleb and Joshua was on God. When problems arise in your life, if the focus of your attention is on the problem, you're going to tend to exaggerate the problem. The problem is going to become larger and it's going to overwhelm you. If, the, if your God is as small as the problem, you've got a real small God. When we have financial problems, when we have marriage problems, when we have health problems, when we have interpersonal relationship problems, the more you focus on the problem, the more the human mind is going to tend to exaggerate the problem. And as the human mind exaggerates the problem, the problem is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. The question is, what are you looking at? Are you focused on the problem or are you focused on the God that's bigger than the problem. If you focus on the giants, you are going to appear as a grasshopper. I don't want to be a grasshopper. You want to be a grasshopper? If you focus on the giants, you're going to be a grasshopper. If you focus on the problems, you are going to tremble in fear rather than move forward in faith. One day, John Wesley, the famed Methodist preacher, was walking down a country road counseling with a man. And this man was telling Wesley about all of his problems. This man was telling Wesley about all of his difficulties. And Wesley, they walked by a pasture and there was a cow in the pasture. And the cow was looking over a wall. And so Wesley stopped and he looked at the cow. And he said to the man, why is that cow looking over the wall? And the man said, what did you say? And Wesley said, why is the cow looking over the wall? And the guy said, I don't know. And Wesley said, because he can't see through it. <laughs> if you are focusing on the wall of troubles, the wall of difficulties, the wall of challenges, the wall of obstacles, you're never going to be, be able to look through that wall. But if you look over the wall to the Christ who is your security, the Christ who is your refuge, the Christ who is bigger than that problem. I love the way it is put in the book Sanctified Life, page 89. It says this, darkness and discouragement will sometimes come upon the soul and threaten to overwhelm us. Now, even as Christians, we at times experience darkness. Even as Christians, we at times experience discouragement. It's so Ellen White says, darkness and discouragement will sometimes come upon the soul and threaten to overwhelm us. But we should not cast away our confidence. We must keep our eye fixed on Jesus, feeling or no feeling. Look over the wall. Look beyond the difficulty. Look beyond the challenge. Focus on Jesus. Now notice, next sentence. We should seek to faithfully perform every known, duty, every known duty and then calmly rest in the promises of God. The ten spies focused on the difficulties 
rather than the open door of God's providence. And because they let their fears overwhelm them, because they focused on the difficulties, they could have entered the promised land in 14 days. When they left Egypt, heading through the Red Sea, watching the destruction of the Egyptians, they could have entered into the promised land in 14 days. But they allowed their doubts, they allowed their fears, they allowed the difficulties and the obstacles and challenges to keep them from entering in to the promised land and they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. The ten spies saw, focused on the difficulties rather than the open door of God's providence. They focused on what their eyes saw rather than heaven's glorious provision for them. Doubt and unbelief kept them from doing what God wanted them to do. And where Caleb and Joshua gave a positive report, they gave a negative report. But notice what Caleb and Joshua said. Numbers chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. Numbers 14. Notice the difference. The difference in focus. The difference between fear and faith. Numbers, the 14th chapter. And we're looking there at verse 8 and 9. The ten spies focused on the largeness of the problems. Caleb and Joshua focused on the bigness of God. The ten spies focused on the difficulties. Caleb and Joshua focused on the possibilities. The ten spies focused on what they thought could not be done and the limitations of human strength. Caleb and Joshua focused on the power of the living God. And so as the ten spies give a negative report, Caleb and Joshua give a positive report. Notice Numbers 14, verse 8. If the Lord delights in us. Now notice Caleb and Joshua recognize indeed that there are challenges. But they say, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. Notice it's not we're going to conquer the land. It's not that our armies are stronger than their armies. It's not that we are wiser. It's not that we're more intelligent. It's not that we have a better uh, fighting force. He will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. When the Lord is with you, you need not fear the obstacles. You need not fear the difficulties. You need not fear the challenges. Caleb and Joshua sensed that their God was bigger than the problem. Their God was greater than the difficulties. Their God was larger than whatever they faced. Caleb and Joshua did not lose their focus on God. They saw what the ten spies saw, but they saw beyond what they saw. They grasped the promises of God. They, see, Caleb and Joshua looked back, and they remembered distinctly the rumble of the Egyptian armies as they were approaching the Israelites at the Red Sea. Caleb and Joshua looked back, and they saw the mighty works of God as he opened the Red Sea. They remembered Israel going through the Red Sea. They looked back and they saw the crashing cascade of the waters as the armies of Egypt were crushed and destroyed in the sea. Caleb and Joshua recognized that God had said to them, build me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. And Caleb and Joshua knew. See, because that sanctuary had been built and Caleb and Joshua knew that between the cherubim in that sanctuary was the Shekinah glory of God. Caleb and Joshua knew that the presence of God was with them, and God's presence would go before them into battle. Here is the good news for you. Here is the good news for me. We are weak, but He is strong. We are frail, but He has enduring might. And as we go into battle this week with the enemy, 
The ark of God, the Shekinah glory of God goes with us. And in that Shekinah glory of God, he will defeat every enemy and break down every foe in our life. Between the cher cherubims of the earthly sanctuary, God's presence was manifest in Shekinah glory. It was this sense of the presence of God with them in all that they did, this abiding sense of the presence of God that fueled their faith, encouraged their hearts, gave them confidence to urge Israel to move ahead and conquer the promised land. As we look to the sanctuary, God is forever present. I love what it says in Numbers 14, 24, as it describes Caleb and Joshua. Numbers 14, and you're looking there at verse 24. It's describing Caleb here, and notice what the Scripture says. See, whether you are gripped with worry and fear and anxiety, whether your mind is filled with doubt and unbelief depends on what we're going to read in this text. Numbers 14, and you're looking at verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. My servant Caleb has a different spirit. His spirit was not one of fear. His spirit was not one of anxiety. His spirit was not one of worry. His spirit was one of calm trust. His spirit was one of deep faith because he knew that the presence of God was with him. In an article in the Review and Herald, May 30, 1912, I read, it was Caleb's faith that gave him courage, that kept him from the fear of man and enabled him to stand boldly and unflinchingly in defense of right. What gave Caleb such courage? His what? His faith. Now notice this next sentence. Through reliance on the same power, the mighty general of the armies of heaven, every true soldier of the cross may receive strength and courage to overcome the obstacles that seem insurmountable. Are there obstacles in your life this morning that seem insurmountable? Are there challenges that you face that for you seem overwhelming? Is the mountain at times in your life so incredibly high that it seems impossible to scale that mountain? Notice what it says in the sentence we just read. Through reliance on the same power, the mighty general of the armies of heaven. Who is that, the mighty general of the armies of heaven? Who is that? That's Jesus, the mighty general of the armies of heaven. Every true soldier of the cross. Are you a true soldier of the cross? Are you a true soldier of the cross? Every true soldier of the cross may receive strength and courage to overcome the obstacles that seem insurmountable. See, we do not overcome in our power, we overcome in his power. <laughs> Caleb and Joshua had no strength to conquer the land. But the presence of God going forth with them would defeat the armies of the Amalekites and the armies of the heathen forces that stood before them. Faith connects us with the divine power of the creator of the universe. Through faith we receive strength and courage to overcome insurmountable obstacles. Now fear and faith are opposites. Fear and faith are opposites. Faith sees the worst. Fear, fear sees the worst. Faith believes the best, and even if the best becomes the worst, faith finds a way through. Fear insinuates doubt. Faith grasps the hand of God and believes. Fear retreats. The fearful Israelites said, let's go back to Egypt. Now, fear does a lot of things to you. Fear pay, plays havoc with the mind. Fear exaggerates the problem, as we said, sees the problem bigger. 
Fear paralyzes you so you don't move forward and do what God wants you to do. Not only does fear do that, fear often causes you to retreat. So in the Christian life, when you face obstacles, if you are filled with fear, if you're filled with worry, you're going to tend to exaggerate the problem, you're going to tend to remain where you are, but then you're going to tend to retreat back to your old lifestyle. That's what fear does to us. It strangles our joy and it keeps us from moving ahead as God would have us to do. Fear retreats. That's why the fearful Israelites cried, let's go back to Egypt. But faith advances. Caleb shouted, let us go up and take the land. Fear regards the unknown as a threat. Faith regards the unknown as a challenge. Fear longs for the comfort of the past. Faith longs for the opportunities of the present. Fear wants the known, the predictable, the status quo. Faith delights in the adventure of the unknown. Fear sees the obstacles. Faith sees the possibilities. Fear cripples, it paralyzes, it stifles. Faith liberates, it frees, it enables. Fear sees what is and trembles. Faith sees what can be and rejoices. Fear exaggerates the problem. Faith sees beyond the problem to the God that wants to solve it. Fear sees the problem as bigger than God. Faith sees God bigger than the problem. Fear infects others with the virus of doubt. Faith inspires others with a serum of hope. Fear tends to blame God for the problem. Faith trusts God through the problem. You see, this is why that Caleb cries out. You see, faith is believing God. Faith is trusting God. Faith is this settled confidence in God. It's moving at God's command. It's obeying God's word. It's walking in God's strength. And, and look what Joshua, Caleb's buddy, cries out. You know it, Joshua 1 verse 9. God speaks these words to you this morning. God speaks these words to you this morning. You're looking there at Joshua chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 9. And listen to these words of hope and let your soul ring with hope. Hope in the Shekinah glory of God. Hope in the glory of God that shines from the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. Hope in that God who's never lost a battle with Satan yet. Joshua chapter 1, and we look there, verse 9. And Joshua says to Israel at a time of doubt and fear. Joshua points this out. He says, Joshua 1 verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, here, Joshua and Caleb saw the Shekinah glory that overflowed from the most holy place of the sanctuary. They saw the pillar of fire that guided them by night. They saw the presence of God in the cloud by day. And so Joshua says, be strong and be of good courage. Look to the sanctuary. There the presence of God is. And Jesus says to you and to me today, in the challenges of life, in the difficulties of life, don't let your mind be focused on the problem and tremble with fear. Look beyond the difficulty. Look beyond the challenge. Look to the sanctuary where the Shekinah glory of God is there, present for you. Now, faith is not faith in yourself. Faith is not faith in your abilities. Faith is not faith in your skills. Faith is not faith in your talents. Faith is faith in God. The God of the universe who created the sun and the moon and the stars. The God who says to the tides, stop here and go no further. The God who says to the sun, rise and it rises and set and it sets. The God who says to the rain, fall and it falls and stop and it stops. The God who says to the flowers, bloom and they bloom. The God who says to the wind, blow and it blows and stop and it stops. So our faith is never anchored in our abilities. Your faith is not anchored in your ability to solve the problem in your family. Your faith is not anchored in your ability to solve the problem in your marriage, the problem in your health, the problem in your money. 
Now, that does not mean that we are stagnant and we don't do anything. God may prompt us to do a lot of things to solve problems. So it's not that we don't do anything, but that's not where our faith is rooted. That's not where our faith is anchored. Our faith is anchored in God. Now, somebody says, that's just the problem. I don't have any faith. My faith is too small. And I'm overwhelmed constantly by worry. I'm overwhelmed constantly by fear. Let me tell you what faith is not. Many Christians have a great misunderstanding about faith. And they have the idea like this. I just need to have more faith. And I just don't have enough faith. I just have to have more faith. False reasoning. False reasoning. Faith is not something that you jack up and try to develop. Faith is something that God works in. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans. Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans, the 12th chapter. Faith is a gift that God gives us that increases as we exercise it. Can you say that with me? Faith is a gift that God gives us that increases as we exercise it. Again, you almost got it. Faith is a gift that God gives us that increases as we exercise it. So this idea that I just need to somehow get more faith is a false idea. Look, here's the text on that. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me. Where does grace come from? Where does grace come from? God. We continue. To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has, dwelt, has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So when I come to Christ, what has God dealt to me? What has he dealt to you? A measure of what? So if I am a believer, I have a measure of what? Faith. Now, you remember what Jesus said? He said, if you have faith as a grain of what? Mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it's going to do what? It's going to move. So God has given you as a Christian a measure of faith. You will be brought by the divine providence of God into challenges in your life. You'll be brought into places where you see mountains before you. God has a strategy. As you exercise the faith that God has already put in your heart, that faith is going to increase and God is going to give you more faith and more faith and more faith. Notice what Scripture says. It says that, Revelation 14, verse 12. Revelation 14, verse 12. At end time, just before the coming of Jesus, our world is going to be overwhelmed with problems beyond which we can imagine. And just before the coming of Jesus, God will have a people who've been given a measure of faith who exercise that faith and trust in Him because Christ is living within, him, within them and they not only have faith in Jesus, but they have the faith of Jesus. You're looking at Revelation 14, verse 12. Speaking of the last days of verse history, speaking of a time when God invites us again to conquer the cities, to enter into the enemy's territory with the gospel, to go out and preach the word and share with others the very word of God. Here, at end time, when the world is overwhelmed with problems that are unimaginable, the Bible says in Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. That word patience means endurance. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, notice it does not say faith in Jesus, although we do have faith in Jesus. But the faith of Jesus, what does that mean, the faith of Jesus? It means the quality of Christ's faith is living in your heart. So God is going to allow you to go through some difficulties. God's going to allow you to go through some challenges. 
He has placed in your heart already a measure of faith. And as you exercise that faith and you see those mountains moved and as you see those problems solved, as you exercise that faith, your, the faith of Christ within you is going to grow and grow and grow because as you exercise the faith, he's going to pour more faith into your soul. He's going to pour more faith into your life. And you exercise that faith and your faith grows and you live at end time with total, absolute trust in Christ and having the faith of Christ fill your heart. Some time ago, I interviewed for It Is Written Television, Todd Houston. Todd Houston is an amazing young man. When Todd was 14 years old, he was water skiing. And as he water skied, he fell off the skis and the boat backed up to pick him up. As the boat backed up to pick him up, it locked in reverse. And as the result of that, the propellers of the boat were spinning rapidly and they ran over Todd and uh, severely severed his leg. The only way to save the leg after the leg became quite infected was to amputate it. So Todd's leg at, was, as a teenager was cut off just above the knee. And uh, Todd, in that process, was led by the Spirit of God into a deeper relationship with Christ. Todd began to study the Word more deeply. He began to trust God more deeply. And Todd is an unusual young man, and he made a decision in his life that in spite of what had happened to him, he would not become bitter with God or not angry with God. He loved mountains. And one day he was reading, and Todd read that uh, the record for climbing the 50 highest mountains in America, in e the, the highest mountain in each of the 50 contiguous states, was 101 days. And Todd said, you know what? I'm going to set a goal with one leg to climb the, the highest mountain in every single state in America. The goal is 101 days. I'm going to do it with one leg. And he began to train. When I met Todd, he had just made 50 climbs. He broke the record in America. He shattered that thing. He climbed the highest peak in every state in 66 days, 22 hours, and 47 minutes. Now, his biggest challenge was Mount McKinley because Mount McKinley is 20,000 feet high. 20,000 feet. So here's a man with one leg that has to maneuver across large crevices and around avalanches. He has to pass over glaciers jutting up against the mountain. He has to endure constant exhaustion and cold. And so I said to Todd, Todd, you're at Mount McKinley. Describe the experience for me. And Todd told me, he said, Pastor Mark, I was... Uh, halfway up the mountain and climbers were coming down and I said to them, what's it like? What's it like? Did you make the summit? And they said, no, we had to turn back because the storms and the high winds are, are, are too fierce. We, we, we were locked in the Denelli Pass with the snow for three days. We just couldn't make it. He said, one man said to him, Todd, the summit loses its significance in the face of survival. I'm just happy to get off the mountain alive. So Todd had to make a choice. Am I turning back? Am I going forward? Am I going to be filled with fear and doubt? And he prayed, God, I set a goal. I am moving forward by your grace. Todd's faith and courage propelled him forward. And I said, why didn't you stop? When you were a teenager and your leg was cut off, why didn't you say, that's it, I'm going to sit in a chair and watch television the rest of my life? And this is what he told me, I'm quoting him now. He said, if you're going to look at the difficulties in your life, if you're going to look at the afflictions in your life, if you're going to look at your injuries and focus on all that stuff, you're going to live around it and they're going to dominate you. But if you focus on the Lord, if you focus on His presence, He's going to get you through it. It's going to become a learning experience, and you are going to move on to become wiser and stronger because of your mountain. Faith 
conquers mountains of difficulty. Faith scales the heights. Faith soars into the heavens in a phenomenal display of courage. Caleb faces his mountain. And Caleb is now 85 years old. When he first went into the promised land to spy it out, he was 40. Israel wanders in the wilderness for 40 years. Five years later, take your Bible. You say, how do you know he's 85? The Bible tells you. And if the Bible says it, I believe it. What about you? All right, Joshua. Joshua 14. Right before the book of Judges. Here we go. You're looking there at the 14th chapter of the book of Joshua. We're going to start there with verse 10. Joshua 14, verse 10. There are people facing mountains of despair, mountains of hopelessness, mountains of defeat, mountains of heartache, mountains of sorrow, mountains of broken dreams and shattered hopes, mountains of seemingly unconquerable habits and unsolvable problems. But here, the words of Joshua come echoing down the centuries, echoing down the millenniums, and they speak to us here today. Joshua chapter 14, you're looking there at verse 10. Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, Joshua says. As he said, these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am, this day, 85 years old. How old was Joshua, everybody? 85 years old. And he's facing a mountain. He's facing a challenge. Man, if I'm 85 and I can walk across the street, I'm going to be thanking God and praising God. But by faith at 85, I'm going to be climbing mountains. And here's Joshua. Verse 11, yet I am as strong this day as I was on the day that Moses sent me. Man, he must have been on a good Adventist health message. 85 years old, as yet I am as strong this day as I was on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, that the cities were fortified. It may be that the Lord shall be with me, and I shall drive them out, says the Lord. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb the son, and so forth. Joshua at 85 years old says, I will not shrink. Joshua at 85 years old says, I will not be paralyzed by worry. I'll not be paralyzed by fear. At 85 years old, in a task that seems impossible before him, Joshua says, give me this mountain. What challenge are you facing today? What difficulty looms before you today? What obstacles are in your pathway today? What mountain is before you today? There is a God that's bigger than your mountain. There is a God that is greater than your obstacles. There is a God that's larger than the difficulties. There is a God whose Shekinah glory shines from the sanctuary filled with the faith of Jesus. You and I can go on to conquer every mountain. Go climb your mountain and in faith believe that through Jesus Christ, you are a conqueror.